Good. So, um, yeah, I was sort of thinking, it's a phrase you often hear people say is how they appreciate um, Charatna and Sankarachita's particular communication of um, of the Dharma. Um, so I, I, I sort of got to thinking, well, why? You know, what what is it about Charatna that I particularly connect with? Uh, and what is it about Sankarachita's particular sort of presentation and emphasis? that I feel has, you know, has been sort of beneficial. I was one of those people that um, when I first came along to learn to meditate, I immediately just sort of connected with, uh, well, the FWBO as it was. I didn't feel the need to go around and sort of try out different uh, Buddhist traditions. Um, so in a way, I haven't sort of stood back and compared. But one of, but one of the things, or the thing that I'd particularly like to um talk about is the emphasis that Sangrachta gives that Charatna gives to the heart in in particular to well the transformation of 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 ourselves on the heart level uh particularly um positive emotion yeah so I'd like to begin by reading out a poem by Sangrachta which in a way encapsulates this uh you might have heard this one it's it's just called sonnet but in it he talks about his sort of um uh well attitude to to buddhism or how, how he sort of finds it communicated somehow and the way that he sees it reading some books you'd think the buddha way as though macadamized ran smooth and white straight as an arrow billboards left and right and that the yellow buses thrice a day whirled past the milestones whose smug faces say nirvana 15 miles by 10 tonight you'll all be there good people and alight outside the peace hotel where you're to stay but those who know those who read their own hearts inly wise know that the way's a hacked path roughly made through densest jungle deep in the unknown and that though burn a thousand baleful eyes like death lamps around serene and unafraid Man through the hideous dark must plunge alone. The ways a hacked path roughly made through densest jungle. <laughs> so it's it's uh, almost as if you know the the Dharma does offer us a method. The Dharma is methodological. Um, it's systematic. Uh, uh, in in a way, there is, there is a it's 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 rational. It's an unfolding. You do this, this unfolds, and so on. There's that aspect to the Dharma, but as it were, the the sort of territory that that applies to, the territory that that is mapped onto, is actually the human heart. Um, and the human heart is is a bit like a jungle, or the human condition uh you know all of our well our whole sort of emotional depths our dream depths uh our history uh our our sort of evolutionary conditioning um as well as the sort of particular sort of social situation that we're in the, the background that we're from um you know our, our different sort of psychologies um the 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 traumas and triumphs that we've come through already in in our lives um uh these are you know these are sort of complex and even though the the dharma itself is sort of um uh like a method in a way somehow each of us 
us to learn how to uh, apply that in the in the actual real context of this uh, this human life. And that there's an aspect to that that only we can do. Only we can sort of bring the Dharma in and, and bring it home uh, in the midst of all of that that sort of depth uh, and complexity. And I think that's something that Sangharashita really gets. I think it's something that really comes across um, in his teachings. I had um, a conversation um, I didn't. I didn't really know Sangharachita very well. I came across him a few times, but one of the conversations, he, in in a way that, that there'd always be a sort of teaching <laughs> that I found. And one one of the conversations that I had was uh, actually it was on my ordination retreat out in Spain, and Sangharachita had come to stay. He used to have a house further down the valley, and he came up to to visit. Uh, for dinner one evening and um i ended up sitting next to him and uh for some reason the subject of opera came up opera music came up and um uh i think i think i i had the sort of sense that with the dharma it's very important not to be sentimental about stuff so i i just sort of made some comment perhaps thinking that it would meet with approval, I made some comment that, oh, I, I found opera music too sentimental. You know, just, uh, it's not it's not a good Dharmic thing and so on. And uh, actually, <laughs> Sankarakshita just wouldn't have it at all. He just turned to me, oh, no. He says, no, no, not at all. He said, uh, very important that we we get in touch with our emotions. Yeah, Very, you know, music like that can really help us to um to contact our emotions and i think what he realized was that well i and probably um a lot of people in in the west or even in sort of modernized cultures generally uh can often be a bit alienated from our emotional experience um and in a way in order to practice the dharma the first thing we need to do is to develop a sort of awareness of that, to, to sort of be, um, well, to be from the heart a bit more and less from less from our heads. Um, so um, I, I, I took that as a bit of a sort of teaching. <laughs> uh, and actually nowadays I do sometimes listening, listen to opera music. And I noticed actually that when Bante did a, a what we call a, a desert island discs, which is a, it's drawn from a BBC program. But he he did a little session where he talked about his favourite tracks of music, and one of them was um, a du the duet or a duet from an opera, the the Pearl Fishers by Bizet, which is very very sort of soulful. It really. Um, uh, the, the music is very, very much sort of from the heart. But I always think of that. Whenever I hear that, I, I think back to that conversation and, uh, and that little sort of teaching from uh, from Sangharachita. But that sort of heartfulness, I think, comes through in the in that particular way. Um, well, in, in what he's drawn from the Buddha's teaching, it's not that he's added anything on, but he's, um, I think, particularly knowing in his sort of translation of Buddhism into the West and in, into the modern world, he has particularly emphasised that because I think he realises that we really need it. And, that, well, just as human beings, that, that we really sort of need that. So that comes across in all, all sorts of ways. Um, um you know one of them for example when when we chant the the precepts together we don't just chant the, the negative precepts uh we we chant the, the positive precepts as well what we're actually trying to open our hearts into and to sort of connect with that so you know the dharma isn't just about not doing a load of stuff <laughs> 
the Dharma is about a positive sort of cultivation of, of the heart, um, of deeds of loving kindness, um, open-handed generosity, uh, and and so on. Um, uh, that, you know, sometimes, um, yeah, rather than focusing on what we're not doing, we need to actually positively cultivate um, connection, human connection, which is what those positive precepts are about in their in their different ways um so it comes across in that way uh another way that it's come come across is um uh you've probably done this but the um in these groups i think but the uh like the what are called the positive nidanas so again the sort of wisdom aspect of buddhism we're not just only seeing the sort of arising of ourselves and as human beings, but we're seeing the positive side of that, the the arising from an awareness of our suffering, the fact that that arises into faith, um, that and that sort of flowers into joy, and so on. So that there's this sort of positive sense of the the spiritual life, not just a, a negation, but as a flowering. Uh, as something kind of really positive and in the and, and kind of unfolding of the of the heart. Again, that Bhante didn't make that up, but he it was a bit of a neglected teaching, so teaching that you don't get in many other Buddhist schools. So he sort of brought that forth as something that that he felt was uh, was needed. Um, another way it comes across is in terms of. Uh, the emphasis on going for refuge, which sounds a bit like a formula, but he's what he's actually saying with that is that um, it's not the externals that matter. It's not the externals um, that make you a Buddhist. It's not this lifestyle or that lifestyle or being a monk or a nun or you know whatever it might be. That in a sense, what that it that it what makes us a Buddhist is what's going on, you know, here. It's what's going on in our heart. It's that basic heart response to the Dharma uh, expressed in an actual sort of commitment to uh, we'll live that out in our lives in whatever way that might be, in whatever context uh, that might be. Um, and another big uh, uh, emphasis um, that, that Sangrat should have given it is, of course, the practice of the metta bhavna um in a way um you know even if we were nothing else as Tarana, even if we were just a bunch of people uh who regularly did the metta bhavna as we've just been doing and we just sort of got together on that basis that itself would be quite a a remarkable thing and that you know that is what we are i think um you know, we're all encouraged to do the Metta Bhavna. Hopefully we do do uh, the Metta Bhavna. And in a sense, it sort of goes for the mindfulness of breathing as well, because in the mindfulness of breathing, we are coming down from our heads. You know, we're coming down into the body, into the place where the breathing happens. And that also brings us much more in connection with our, our emotions. But obviously it's with the, the Metta Bhavna that we, really sort of uh, focus on those, really sort of cultivate, directly cultivate um, uh, positive uh, warmth, loving kindness, uh, and so on. And, um, uh, I mean, I, you know, I've been doing the Metta Bhavna for half my life now. <laughs> uh, um, and I, you know, I really honestly feel you, well, well, yes, I can say two things. That it, yes, it's transformative. I've got complete sort of faith in that. That that you know, this idea that the metta bhavana can take you all the way to awakening. Um, I do feel that. I do sort of resonate with that. And yet, also, I feel that I've only scratched the surface. That it's a deep, deep um, practice. Um, the metta bhavana. Um, the the um, the the sort of strength and depth of metta that is 
that we can sort of potentially access is is almost unimaginable yeah this is what we're trying to do in the meta uh you know we should never sort of think that we've we've sort of mastered the the meta that we've sort of finished it that we've got it you know sometimes i, I do that it, sometimes i sort of suddenly another aspect of the meta sort of gets to me and i think all oh, right now i understand <laughs> But even that's only provisional. Even that's only provisional. And um, I think, um, uh, yeah, just occasionally it's good to just sort of glimpse how how deep that can go, or or, or just sort of realise that there are always sort of more depths, stronger sort of meta. In a way, you could say, you know, we've never. You never finish the meta bhavna. <laughs> You've never done it. You can never sort of put a tick next to it. Um, uh, you know, un until, you know, until, for example, you really sort of in touch with a sense of meta towards yourself um, that is strong and constant. You know, a, a, a profound sense imbuing every second of your life that you are significant, that you that you matter, um, that 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 in a way you are cherished in the universe. That almost like the the universe itself cherishes you. That you are significant. That every action, every feeling, sort of matters. Um, you know, until we can relate to our friends with a complete sense of sort of freedom, uh, complete. Again, that that sort of cherishing uh, of of not sort of wanting anything back from them, but just being complete sort of um, outflow of 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 loving kindness to our friends. Um, until in a way, uh, I'm going through the stages here. You might have noticed but until um, any sort of sense of of apathy towards other people towards sort of random people in the street or you know where you work that in a way you're constantly aware that you're surrounded by cherishable beings <laughs> uh who've got their own life uh and you you know you're able just to sort of access that in an instant um and until uh, uh our, our sort of feeling for loving kindness is kind of strong enough to overcome any views that we have any sort of opinions that we have any judgments that we have any sort of sense by which we might kind of think of people as other as different uh, until it's strong enough to go again across these sort of great divisions of um, well different religions different genders different nationalities uh, and so on um you know, until, uh, yeah, until our um, meta is sort of strong enough to completely overcome any kind of uh, instinct towards enmity um, or conflict uh, in any way, um, but but just to. Uh, well, to, to sort of meet conflicts with complete love and kindness, um, then in a way, well, we haven't, um, we're not done with the meta bhavna before all those things uh, are in place. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, I, I just really appreciate that that is right at the heart of our practice as, um, again, it's something taught by the Buddha but something that Sangharaksha has sort of brought forth um, into each of our lives. And of course, the ultimate, and I'll finish with this, the, the, the ultimate sort of expression of positive emotion, um, which which you won't find in in every Buddhist tradition, but which is which is really at the heart of Charana is the is the Bodhisattva ideal. That in a way the whole um the whole sort of basis for doing what we're doing 
um, is to sort of burst beyond the bounds of self, that it's not about my practice isn't just about me. It's not even just about me developing a nice little sense of meta loving kindness towards other people. It's it's bigger even than that. Uh, that um, uh, that in a way through the the meta bhavna, we're sort of making a gift of our our lives. It's almost this sort of feeling that our lives, um, the the our being, is almost meant to be given away. That that. Uh, the point of a human life is to is to give it away that's where it reaches its sort of deepest beauty its deepest meaning its to be deepest um fulfillment uh and that you know that that is expressed um in the in the bodhisattva ideal and of course the bodhisattva vow which was something that that um Sangrashta took from dada rinpoche uh and again, that that connects us into a whole sort of bodhisattva lineage. Um, uh, again, that you know, we're not just um, practicing uh, in our own little context, but we're part of a, a kind of human, a lineage of human beings who've who've uh, practiced in this way, who've given their lives um, for the benefit of. Uh, all beings uh human and non-human uh that they've uh done that you know for centuries and this sort of goes back to to the buddha it's not in other words it's not just an abstract teaching <laughs> buddhism it, we're actually connecting in again to something of the heart something human uh we're connecting into the sort of these this lineage of lives um uh, that goes back to to the Buddha himself. So, um, I th you know, I think that's what I, if I if I had to sort of choose one aspect of of Taratna and of, of Sankarachita's presentation, I think it would be something along those lines, just something that, um, something of that sort of openness that it's not the Dharma isn't abstract; it's not about negation. Uh, it's about something really um, positive, and, and it it meets the complexity. It meets all the the flaws and the shortcomings, uh, um, the complications, and the you know the the dense jungle of uh, of what it is uh, to be a human being. So, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, if you've got any questions or comments, we've got five or ten minutes left, so fire away. <laughs> Thanks, you, Cooper. Does your life feel like a, a dense jungle sometimes? <laughs> your <laughs> psyche, your being. And then what you said about the Bodhisattva ideal and this a giving away of one's life, that you know, that sounds quite challenging in the midst of having a, a jungle of a life. How mm. how you know how would you do that? Mm. It's quite sort of counterintuitive. Mm. Maybe, um, mm. but a gift. I love how you put it, like a gift of our lives. Well, I suppose you you need meta to feel like you have you have something to give. I suppose, well, that you are, yeah, as you say, significant. Maybe maybe, maybe it's sort of because um, I think that can seem quite sort of challenging. But maybe it's just something. Well, if you start doing the meta bhavana. Obviously, you know, to begin with, when you do the Metta Bhavna, it is definitely you doing the Metta Bhavna and it's about your practice and your sort of states of mind. But by its very nature, it's connecting you with other people, isn't it? By its very nature, it's bringing you outside of 
your sort of narrow sense of yourself it's it's sort of like especially that that moment in the meta bhavna where we go from stage one to stage ourselves and it, it's like that we're crossing a great divide when we do that <laughs> reference to other reference from self to to other and um well you, you know carrying on doing that um it's natural that well eventually that sort of gets to the point where you re realize that it's not all just about me and my practice um it's almost that the meta bhavana will naturally unfold into um that, that sort of more more general kind of other regarding that affects even your whole motivation for practice. You realize that in a way I can do the meta bhavana in order to feel happier in myself. Um, but that ultimately you sort of see that, well, actually what makes me happier in myself is uh, paradoxically <laughs> not being self-preoccupied and you know the more that we that we're connected with other the, in, in a way the happier we can be but we need to discover that from ourselves not just sort of impose it on as a kind of ideal um but the meta bhavana is the way in which we discover that i don't know if you have a sense of that in your own practice of the meta bhavana I, I do, and it's very interesting. It's exactly as you described it. Um, um, I think uh, practicing the Metta Bhavna has made me, in a way, um, more thoughtful of other people, in a way, kinder with other people, and, and um, um, being kinder with other, with other people, kind of like um has turned turned me into a less selfish person um i'm not constantly thinking about me and my own needs or the things that i i want for myself um when i try to be kind probably i'm also thinking in what other people need to yeah with other what i want for other people um, or how i want to help other people yeah which is um which makes me yeah, a lot more, uh, less selfish, I would say, and connects me with, with others. Uh, and, you know, uh, I really, yeah, very well said. Mm -hmm. mm. I like, I like that too, how you said that every, every individual at the start, you know, the jungle of the heart and we're complex and you know multifaceted so as you say we, we each need to come to it in our own way and yeah you, you could you could go straight to the wisdom teachings and you know think you know just think of other people all the time and um try to try to access i don't know that that experience or that that aspect of meta but yeah, unless you actually have a of that sort of foundation of metta, particularly towards oneself. Again, it's that's going to be tricky, or just an idea, I and mean, just maybe um, exerting a whole lot of energy, and you don't feel like you get anywhere. Get, and it can be very hard to get down to the well. The first stage, a lot of people struggle with in the relation. I mentioned last week in big coming in relation into relationship with oneself can be tricky so uh so yeah, yeah as you say where yeah w what point do you start to you know think more of others and through through the meta bhavana and you know struggling along and um and like you i, I, I keep discovering things about the meta bhavana and struggle with it and uh but it, yeah a lot of the time it's in relate it's my relationship to others so it's 
so what's my relationship like to myself and so yeah the, the individual path I suppose whatever's necessary mm. Mm. and it, it, each day will be very different as well mm. Yeah. And I really like what you said, um, that um the metabhavna might be a way to take you to Nirvana. Of course we're way far from that. Yeah, but I think yeah, it also I really like the way you put it because yes, is is about becoming kinder, yeah. Um with yourself, with others, and, and how do you develop that? Mm, yeah, bodhisattva ideal, yeah, through that. And, well, I suppose noticing that when you do become kinder in other regarding that, oh, actually, this is actually quite happy, isn't it? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is where the happiness comes from. Yeah. Free yeah. yeah. Well, thank goodness for that, not to be so sort of... Uh, self preoccupied yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. and you mentioned the mindfulness of breathing um yeah, being aware of emotions uh, again, working working on the emotions. Um, I was talking last week because we did the mindfulness of breathing. I'd just been hearing a bit about again relationship um, and how that how our natural human relationships, being so social beings, helps us or actually stimulates parts of the brain um, that. Uh, creates growth and connectivity and, and rapport and all of that. And that, so backed by science, the, the re, being in relationship to oneself through the mindfulness of breathing is in a way like doing the first stage of the metabhavana, you could say. Um, yeah. So trying to, in the mindfulness of being, breathing, being in a positive relationship to whatever's present, um, whatever, whatever distractions, whatever habitual kind of go-to, um, you know, distractions, just being in relation to kind, yeah, with a kind attention, being in relation to ship to that, um, yeah, we will grow. We will um, we'll have a better um, relationship to ourselves in that way. Mm. It's almost like the, the mindfulness and breathing and the, the meta bhavana, yeah, they're not completely separate in a, in a way they're coming to the same mm. thing of, of, of well, kindly awareness, isn't it? Mm. So, mm. Warm, kindly awareness. Mm. And you think through concentration, the, the more you become concentrated, the more kind of p pleasure and pleasantness that can arise um, that can be cultivated quite easily in the mindfulness of breathing and then the sort of awareness of others that sort of opening up in the metta bhavana with with warmth that can can be a very similar um, experience as well mm. 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 And you mentioned the unit that was quite an interesting way of seeing it as well that, that uh, as a deep practice being significant in the universe cherishing you as well. Uh, interesting way of. 
Mm. Yeah, being in relationship to to oneself and to to the world. Mm. I've not I've not maybe I've heard it in different ways, uh, said in different ways. A bit of a difficult one to express, isn't it? That um, the sort of that sort of depth of self meta, which mm. maybe just we can just sort of touch on at least from time to time uh, but the, yeah sort of profound sense of yeah. of being held or um uh, well you know of, of of one's own preciousness in a way and mm. beauty and mm. meaning and, mm. uh so, so you know, I wonder how much of our time are we? Does that sort of just get lost a bit, and we we get a bit sort of focused on, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, or being good enough, um, you know, whatever yeah. it might be, yeah. or you know, trying to be better than others or um, equal to others, or uh, all that sort of striving yeah. that we do. Mm. Um, yeah are we able to sort of just contact something that can just sort of put that all that aside mm. 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 I suppose my sense is that it's just something um it, it the, the, I, I sort of feel that, you know, I sometimes sort of touch on all of that. <laughs> but I just feel that there's a sort of a much vaster sense of that that's available to, to us to to contact. Mm. It's 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 not sort of limited, if you know what I mean. Mm. Mm. Sort of um, in its depth and mm. intensity and availability. Mm. Sarah Rich. Mm. Um, the other day, I was thinking of the word transcend, and um, um, how how everything in the Dharma is is about transcending our limitations and what is, let's say, fixed by I don't know what, but our physical body ways in this life um um the other day well last week we were studying with Radapa in the in the study course um about um um the fifth percept yeah and um yamamoto san and i were talking about the um, the mindfulness of purpose uh, how the mindfulness of purpose is, um, yeah, and and it's so rich because um, we also have to transcend the the um, this adulthood and try to remember how our purity is as we, we were when we were ch children, yeah, how pure we were, yeah, the. And every time I see children, let's say, uh, they dance, they look at you in the eyes. They don't know you, but they look at you in the eyes. You know, they um, they just do these things that we, because we're so stained with, you know, suffering and all different experiences in life. Um, we just don't do that, but... Mm. Is about transcending the limits of yourselves, of yourself too. In the meta bhavna, is that not everything is about yourself? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. There but, is something. There's definitely a sort of childlike openness. Yeah. Although, you know, I suppose it's worth thinking that it's not all sweetness and light to be a child. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> 
on the, the sort of suffering and 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 so on that they're, they're not sort of completely people but there's definitely it's definitely true that there is a sort of almost like a childlike openness which mm. which we need to sort of bring to things yeah yeah it's very rich I think I've, I've actually I've, I've just remembered I forgot one of my other points about Toronto which is perhaps a bit late to sort of bring it in but um because I didn't have the list in front of me um <laughs> Uh, the other point was just the emphasis on friendship, which is a, a massive aspect of all of this, again, of it being a sort of path of the heart. Um, you know, the uh, which is a huge emphasis of, of Toronto, which I think we, you know, is often remarked on by, by other Buddhist schools as a sort of real positive, the sort of sense of friendliness and and friendship. Um, you know, you often hear of other schools where people sort of go to a meeting and get the teachings and then they just sort of go away again. I often hear that, whereas in Tarantana there's this very strong emphasis on, no, we, you know, we form sanghas, we're doing what you're doing here. Um, you know, we'll do, we, we become friends uh, and so on. Um, uh, that, you know, friendship itself is a is a practice. Now, again, that wasn't something that um, Sakurajita had to bring in, you know, that he had to emphasise, but he, he very much did. And, you know, well, again, for me personally, that's it's just such an incredible sort of boon to be part of something that's actually... There's a sort of again, it's a sort of ideal of spiritual friendship, but it sort of maps onto well, no real heart-to-heart -heart human communication. Real, uh, it sort of maps onto just like ordinary human friendship, and you know, really, again, I don't know, just uh, the feeling of it's so sort of rich to have something like. A sangha, be part of a sangha, <laughs> uh, to have that in your life, to sort of feel that you're part of this connected network of friendships that, you know, in our case, spreads across the world. And here we are, you know, mm -hmm. three different continents. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I know, Susanna, you've travelled to India and, and so on, that you can go to a Chiratna centre in, in Aurangabad or... Um, or in uh, Mexico City or Melbourne, Newcastle, wherever it is, and you you're part of this of this sort of um, community, of this sort of heartfelt community. And that's an amazing boon in one's life. It's just what a beautiful thing to be part of in one's life. That's what, that's how I feel about it. You know, even if you just put the rest aside, that just that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, very precious. Mm -hmm.